it's a good idea in general to visualize where the ureter is, as you see here, and then to go medial enough to be away from the vessels that they dissect down the pelvis. Both the instruments used to pick up on the peritoneum to stretch it out. I did not speed up this portion of the procedure. I want to show how careful and methodical you need to be over the sacrum. Some people will do this procedure first just in case they're unable uh, to dissect uh, the area over the sacrum that is necessary. I had a case recently where the patient had a type of surgery on her spine and there was a plastic wrap placed uh, um, due to a leakage that she had, spinal leakage, and we were not able to place the um, product over the sacrum with that patient. And if we would have started right away on that area and seen that, we could have immediately done our modifications and done something different without doing the full dissection. It's important to try to open this area up as wide as possible so you could easily see the area you want to operate. One of the things that's really helpful is to just gently tap over this area. If you get a really big uh, what's often called a trampoline effect where you touch this over this area and you get a lot of uh, bounce that suggests there's large vessels um, underneath that uh, you must be careful of or increase um, fat over the sacrum and it's just really important to be careful where you um, dissect and how rapidly you dissect here so I'm tapping here you so notice how there's minimal bounce right there. So I'm going to open that area up a little bit. I'm going to go very slow here. I'm zoomed in. I adjusted the lighting so that I had less um, reflections. I could see the smaller vessels. Some people would even inject ICG at this point. See that bounce? There was minimal bounce in that area. When I would tap, I could see haptically that there was minimal movement in my left instrument. And if I were to get a big bounce there, I know I need to go either more medial or more inferior away from those vessels. And that area is a little soft right there, and so I'm going to make sure that I uh, take this vessel here and move it off to the side, as you see here go a little bit more inferior. That area right there is the money spot. So I'm going to just gently open that up and I'll start to clearly start seeing the sacrum right there now. That ligament that sits right over the top. That's a good safe area to go. And you want to make sure you have enough um, dissection here. So it's not difficult to attach the mesh in this area. But you don't have to skeletonize a huge area here. You just need enough to be able to attach. And that white area you see there is plenty well dissected. That is about all you need. At this point I'm going to start dissecting down toward the top of the vagina using both instruments to help me pull on the edges of the peritoneum to make that dissection. Now I have sped this up to power. You can see the, where the ureter is off to the side. I did that so those watching this procedure don't have to sit and watch uh, in real time so we can get this going because the important part of the procedure I showed, you can see that little reflection of peritoneum there. That's a good place to go. And the ureter is well above that. You can see it up high right in this area going down the pelvis. You want It's it's a, it's super important not to get too close to that ureter with that perineal dissection because when you close it later you don't want to tent it or pull it into your closure where the ureter has any kind of compromise that, or is kinked. But you need to really open this up enough so that you have enough peritoneum to cover this mesh at the end of the case. So I'm just using both these instruments to stretch this area out and see really clearly where I want to go. In this area, you start getting close to where the uterosacral ligament is. 
but sometimes it'll get a little woody or difficult to dissect. Just be careful not to damage that weakened uterosacral ligament any more than you need to. Take down just enough so that you can cover your mesh at the end of the procedure. I'm going to come across the top. I placed a, a vincula or roomy um, arch connected to a small vaginal man manipulator tip. This is also connected to something called the UPS or uterine positioning system made by Cooper Surgical. This allows uh, for uh, the assist not to have to be between the legs. At this point I'm going to start dissecting this peritoneum down but we will we have a Foley that is sterile on the field and we're back filling it so we could see just where the reflection of the bladder is so we don't make mistakes and inadvertently uh, damage the bladder. This is very helpful. The assistant's just hitting the sacrum there with the, the positioning system and is figuring out where to put it. Once you push that foot pedal and position it, you can let go and it'll maintain that position. That way the person can stay above. There are different ways of dissecting this out. There's the push, spread, and pull technique. That's where you take the tip of the instrument, push it in, and spread it, and then pull. I, I, I favor um, using more bovi, especially when I know where I'm at, and I'll use the tip of the scissor and kind of gently tease the area as you see here. I, I think both ways work really well. I think whatever technique you use, just use good common sense. Um, having that bladder filled up there, I know I'm nowhere near the bladder at this point of the dissection, so I'm safe to go ahead and do this technique this way. If I'm more concerned about the tissues, then I will do that push spread technique. I love that technique uh, uh, on the posterior side, that spread from side to side. It's just in here, there's, I, don't, I don't really don't like a lot of bleeding, so I, I'm a little more careful in this area. Uh, but having these wristed instruments here really helps. And have an assist come in and help hold up that peritoneum so you can use both hands if possible. But just make sure they drain that bladder and push in that UPS system uh, with that Cooper Surgical vaginal manipulator. If you're questionable about how low you are and where the ureters are, because the ureters can come in down here on the lower side and you can inadvertently damage those because the ureter comes in and kind of curves up right about in that area. You know, just really pull that up as wide as you can and then have somebody come in with their finger just underneath the, the base of the urethra and they can gently pull up their finger in there up or they can pull back on the a really gentle pull on the fully bulb you see that fully bulb bouncing you know exactly where the base of the bladder is that's a great technique if you just want to get an idea and that's what just happened a minute ago as they were gently bouncing that fully bulb try to go as wide as you think is necessary but don't damage any existing connective tissue. That left side has some healthy connective tissue, so I'm trying to preserve that as long as I feel like I have enough room. So I'm going to take a little of this down here, kind of dissect that off. Just making sure I get the width I need uh, so that this mesh can lay in there flat and that I don't have to trim it too much. And there's that push, spread, and pull technique. Well, the assist has come in with the suction. They could come in with another device as well just to kind of give you support and help pull up on that. Now that that's dissected, uh, we're going to reposition that UPS upward. And I can start dissecting the posterior aspect here. And this is where that separating from side to side really comes in handy. So I kind of use my instrument, kind of turn it sideways so I don't inadvertently put a hole in anything. And then I can have my assist hold that off to the side, stretch it out, and I can get both hands in there and just really that push, spread, pull, push, spread, pull, 
great technique for dissecting here. And, and this is sped up to two, pow two times normal speed. Just, uh, I, you know, I want you to get the idea of how this technique is done, but I don't want you to have to sit through the full 58 minutes that this sacrocopopexy took. That was the length of this procedure. I've cut it down so that it's under 30 minutes so that you don't have to sit and watch too long. If you're like I am, you don't want to sit watching these procedures too long. You want to get the gist of it so you can learn little techniques. At this point, I am going to ask my partner here in a minute to put his finger in right um, at the base of her perineum, kind of just to get an idea how low I'm dissecting back here uh, and whether I need to go down lower. That uh, fourth level of support, the perineal body, is better taken care of with a... There we go. There he is. He's right there. So I know I'm fairly low at this point. That fourth level of support is better taken care of with a perineal orphy or perineoplasty rather than trying to fix it from above. And I'm just making sure I have plenty of room down here as well. Got the width I need for that mesh. This whole dissection really did not take a lot of time. Probably less than uh, 15 minutes. And, and, and that's how it should be. Now, I like bringing in the mesh without rolling it. I know that drives some people crazy. But I like it not being rolled, and I like to be able to kind of get an idea of exactly where to place this. And I have found that smaller, thin arm there is what goes to the sacrum, and the fatter part of the mesh is what goes around the vagina, both anterior and posterior. So I'm positioning that in place. And... Uh, I don't trim it. Uh, I, you know, I find that leave a nice gap above the top of the vagina. Um, that way, you don't have to worry that you cut it too short or too long. So I'm just kind of getting an idea where to cut that suture, that mesh, um, and I'm going to cut a little piece off that, and I'm going to err on the side of having excess mesh or, uh, at the Y above the top of the uh, the vaginal um, cul-de-sac or the vaginal uh, apex and I, I just cut the edges around there because down there lower that dissection tends to come that way and I just have the assist come in grab that extra and I'm gonna lay that down in there and I, I actually like um, attaching it down low first and then kind of working back um, that way I haven't committed myself uh, to the wrong area I think sometimes people like to wrap that mesh around the top of the vagina and I I find that's where that mesh erosion can occur. The real support comes um, on the anterior and posterior full length of the vaginal mucosa with just a little attachment near the top of the vagina, but the overall very top of the vagina should be left with that gap in my opinion. And I like using 2O Gore-Tex. And what we do is we have them bring that in through the eight um, accessory port and see, we're bringing it all the way down there, and I'm going to tie that right now. They're bringing that in through the eight accessory port. And watch what happens when I pull up. They go ahead and grab that suture, pull it back out through there. Now, they've had to straighten the needle ever so slightly, but I can keep reusing the suture over and over as a result. So I can tie this knot very quickly. I'm going to tie it, cinch that down. That's a good thing about Gore-Tex is it allows you to really slide that knot down well. It's nice and soft. And when I'm done doing this, you'll see that he's ready to go. My assistant has that next suture right there for me. See that? Boom. Ready to go. And I can take that. I can attach the next attachment point. And you know the how much suture to place and how many places to put it? I think that is uh, the $6 million question because we don't want to put too many and we don't want to do too little. We don't want to do just right. And I, I think we're all still trying to figure out what's too many and what's too little. So anterior here, I kind of went a little less than normal. And uh, posterior, I probably put a little more. Like that back corner there, I didn't put anything. I'm just tacking this down. Uh, you may see when you watch this, you feel like that I should have done additional uh, placement of permanent suture. Some people will actually run a V-lock after doing a few tacks to kind of make sure this is all married to the vaginal mucosa. I don't think it's necessary, and then you have that V-lock suture kind of pulling on all the vaginal mucosa, and I don't love that. 
And I sped this up to eight times power uh, speed so that we, once you see how I figure out where to place it, it's just all about tacking these in. And uh, this is the total number I use anterior. And this is the highest I go on the vaginal mucosa. I don't put any over the top like that. See that gap there? It's at least several centimeters in size. Now what we can do is lift that UPS vaginal manipulator up and we can kind of see pulling on that upper part of the mesh to see where do I need to attach the posterior aspect. Now I had examined her earlier and seen that her rectocele was more significant than her cystocele and so there's going to be slightly more tension posterior than there is anterior. And that comes with time. I'm going to hold that in place with that right hand. You see that? That's to make sure the tension's right. I'm going to pull that mesh out of my way. I'm going to use my left hand to kind of position it so this is in the right spot. And then I'm going to tack that in place. And once again, I don't want to go at the very top. I want, I want to go down just a little bit away from the apex of the vagina and tack that. Once that's in place, I can check to see if the tension's right. So I'll do another one on the other side, and then I'll check that. Cortex is so easy to tie. does not requ require surgeon's knots because it can slide so smoothly and easily. You can really tighten that knot down. It, it means you need to throw plenty of knots though, so be careful not to throw enough uh, knots in the suture because it can loosen up because of how easy it slides. You don't want to make those tails of the, of the suture too short either. You want nice and firm and tight. An additional stitch will be placed on the right side at the same level, right at the top, at the apex of the vagina, but not at the top of the vagina per se, just the very top of the posterior vaginal mucosa. What I'm trying to do is make sure that that's in the right location, right tension, and then I'll place that suture. It's nice if you can go right through the mucosa. Um, the mesh on both sides, but just capturing the edge is fine as well. Once again, you're really trying to tack this down so that the tissues will ingrow into this mesh. That's why these mesh um, products are super lightweight and they have large pores on them. That's what we found is better for vaginal mesh. This particular mesh here is made by, comp it's called Coldaplast. Uh, I really like this mesh because of how soft it is. I like how the upper arm is thinner, so it's easier to see which part is to be attached to the sacrum. And it's wide enough so you have plenty of mesh to use, and long enough so you have a nice Y above the apex, whether you leave the cervix or take it. I like to leave that little um, Y area above it. I know um, that's some people don't, but I, I find that works better. Now that I've done with that second suture placement, um, you can really just kind of see, is this, is this the right level? Is that the right amount of tension anterior and posterior? See how I'm pulling on that? I'm just kind of trying to get an idea and look. It looks pretty good. So I'm going to do one more there in the middle, and then I'm going to really kind of check it out a little bit more. But I like that. And it's why I like having that Y above the top. I'm not committed to wrapping that around, hoping I got the right amount of tension anterior and posterior. So I know that that's the perfect amount of tension, both anterior posterior. And I can, I can decide how much I put one side versus another. So I can put slightly more tension um, posterior than anterior. And I've sped this up um, because this is that part where we're going to just do a whole lot of sutures here. And I don't want to bore you with all that process. I'm going to roll this back in that space. How much do I need to cut off? I'm looking in there. I'm having my assist come in and help. I'm going to go ahead and trim that right now. You can actually use your Mega Suture Cuts if you want. It's a little more crude in its ability to cut, but it works. The next process is to lay that down in there, and then let's throw in whatever amount of sutures that are required. And I went kind of down lower to make sure I straighten that all out. I'm going to tie that in place. 
Make sure you put plenty of knots. Go over to the other side, do the same thing. Just tacking that all down so it's well applied. Great thing about learning with do sacred copex is you learn to tie a lot of knots. And it's not a bad thing to do. But you notice how my assistant is just constantly feeding me that suture? When it starts getting short, um, then it becomes a little more difficult uh, for them to help. But I'm still having them help. I think I brought in a new piece because I damaged the other suture. So they brought in the other one. I bent the needle tip. So this is a full length one again. And it's just constantly ready to go. That allows me not to have to worry about multiple cut sutures and wasting sutures. And it's actually very fast. So I've placed everything in there. I'm going to now check to see, hey, do I like what I have here? I do. I like it. It's uh, equal pressure, maybe a little bit more posterior than anterior, which is what I want. And this is the crucial part of sacral copexy. At this point, I want to pull that straight, and then I want to use one of my hands and place it against the sacrum and hold it in place. Now, if you have a physician assisting you at this point and you trust them to know the proper tension on the vagina, then you could have them check right now. Say I'm holding that in place. You could say, hey, will you please check her vaginally? As you see, there's a lot of movement vaginally. The assistant who's helping me today is a surgeon who I trust. He says, no, you need it a little tighter. So you notice I pulled up a little more. He's going to check it again. He says, oh, that's perfect. That's just right. So now I have that marked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that mesh right at the level I want to attach it with my left hand. And then I'll bring in uh, and place that through that ligament on the sacrum. And I'm not going to move that left hand because I know exactly where I want to be. I'm going to just go ahead and drive that there. Now, if I didn't have the ability to see where I wanted to be, uh, you know, if I couldn't easily get to that area without a lot of help with retraction, then I couldn't mark that. But this is a great way to do it because I know exactly where I want to place this suture um, through the mesh because I marked it with my left hand. So that's showing me where to place it. This other person here can kind of come through and help me at this point. You could actually have your assist grab that same spot as well. So, you know, so there, I'm going through that mesh. Now, this is what I love doing with this mesh. I love rolling it. See how I'm going through a separate um, location so it kind of rolls on itself? It allows you to have more purchase surface area for um, this mesh to go and as a result it's going to have a better attachment point to the back of the sacrum um, it's going to roll onto itself so when you put sutures through it it's not going to go through just one or two little areas it's going to go through a large area i've frayed that ethabon just a little bit i got greedy there and so it's a little harder to pull through so i'm going to have to just kind of reach up and do it Grab that little edge there and kind of put it down as much as I can in there and then pull it through. When it frays like that, it's hard to get through. It's worth this effort, though. I'm telling you, it makes a, such a difference on the attach point. I've had a failure in the past, and I was at this attachment point, and we were using a tacking device, and it just wasn't holding through that mesh well. This is one of my favorite things I've ever learned. It's called the square knot to slip knot. I learned it from a general surgeon. And basically what we're going to do now is hold that in place. And we're going to tie a square knot. <clears throat> so we're going to pull on this mesh, on this uh, suture. This is an Ethabon 2O. And I'm going to tie a knot here. It's going to go right over left. you got to tie it down square, left over right now. You can see this is a tied square. And then I'm going to lift up on this with the needle drivers. And I'm going to pull on that little 
piece right there and turn it into a slip knot. Watch what happens when I pull on that. It now becomes a slip knot. Now I can guide that down and it'll cinch down super snug against that fascial attachment point. Now I can turn it back into a square knot by pulling on it again. And it's cinched down. It's a great type of way of tightening something down so there's no air knot no tension and see how I've wadded up that mesh right there in that location to create a great attachment point and I'm gonna put an additional um, I put two of these here I know there are some people say well why two when you can do it with one well what if one fails then you have the second one there as support this is a difficult surgery to do you don't want to ever have to come back and redo it so you want to do it right the first time I'm gonna cut that and I'm gonna put another suture here I can see clearly where that I had plenty of to work with there. And I did the same thing, square knot to slip knot. And I'm tying that all down. And now I'm done. And we can trim that mesh. Give yourself a little tag there. Don't want it too close to where you attached it. And now we can look at our work, re-examine, and we can start reparatonalize this whole area. I just use a V-lock. Uh, and I close this area with a 2.0 V-lock. I've used 3.0, but I think 2.0 is better. It's a little stronger suture. And I just start in that left corner over there, and I'm gonna work and just close this whole area. And I've really sped this up, because you don't, once again, don't need to see. And I'm gonna use my left, right, my third arm to kind of hold that bowel out of the way so I can reach back there and get that posterior peritoneum. That's the hard part to get. You just keep working it. Now there is a trick if you do a hysterectomy, you kind of have um, two areas of peritoneum over on this right side. Since we didn't, we we'll, this already had a hysterectomy, we have this nice little line we're going to follow. But just be careful that you don't capture that ureter on the right side with this peritoneal closure. We're not going to. But I, just so when you do it, make sure you don't do that. You don't have to have these two close together, but you just don't want mesh showing, right? You don't want to have to see any mesh. So you want them nice and snug. You'll see here at this one point that I don't quite get this mesh closed the way I like it to. And I'm going to go back and kind of fill that area in. But there's the area. See, we're going to close that now. I just don't get, I got greedy there. So see how that little mesh showing? I'm going to take a bite up here and I'm going to go back down here. And I'm not going to like that. I'm going to say, ooh, I don't want to see, I don't want to see mesh. So I'm going to go back and just kind of work down to the very edge so I cover it. And there we go. Now I'm happy. It covers that mesh. That third arm helps keep the peritoneum up. And I stayed completely out of the way of the ureter over on the right. So I'm not so worried about this right sidewall closing this. But if you get a little too close to the ureter, you, you might almost have to take the ureter down off the peritoneum so you don't take a risk. We're just going to finish closing this. This procedure took just under an hour in real time and there was literally absolutely no blood loss when we were done and we looked vaginally at this patient you couldn't even tell we operated on her her vaginal support was totally there i did do a perineoplasty on her or perineal orphy and uh, she went home the very next morning said she had minimal pain in fact she said her pain felt better and that's what i hear often i do lock this last one or two stitches here um, and then that way it won't unravel. As you can see, this is our repair. And uh, I think you will really be happy with the results of this. I sisto everybody to make sure the ureters are okay. Make sure to take the sutures out. And don't try to cheat. Use all the five. Um, use the extra arm. Also, make sure you use an eight accessory port. I, I use no 12 ports. That way I don't, don't have to worry at all about closing any in the trocar sites worrying about hernia and uh, that saves you time worrying about hernias as well and it's less pain for the patient thank you for watching i hope this was a lot of help for you